Praise the Lord, church. Greetings uh, in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, the past few weeks, we have been in Acts chapter 8, and uh, we've been covering the ministry of Philip with the interaction with the Ethiopian eunuch and also with Simon the magician or the sorcerer. Uh, I'm rewinding a bit to the beginning of chapter Acts chapter 8 so we can get a better context of where we are chronologically. This is perhaps hard to believe, but we're already about um, within the first five to seven years of church, early church history already. Um, and that's just an estimate. Um, sometimes when we read chapter by chapter, we think that these events happen over a course of a few months, but uh, that, that is not the case. It's been a little bit over five years at this point. So when we uh, also read the names of the places in the book of Acts, sometimes we tend to gloss over the details, and we don't know the difference between a place like Cyprus or Cyrene, for example. So today we're going to cover a lot of geography and uh, so that you get a larger perspective as to what God is doing from a global perspective. Also, we'll talk about some topics about missiology, which is basically uh, the study of Christian mission. And um, so we're going to start by reading a couple of um, portions in Acts that describes what's happened, what's ha what happens to the church after the death of Stephen. Um, and while I read these portions, and I trust that my, the slide that I have will be up there on the screen, um, you will see the map. Um, you'll see the map of these places that I'll, I'll be reading. So we're going to start from Acts chapter 8. 1 through 4. If we, uh, we can turn to the slide. Next slide, please. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. For those who are tracking with me, you can find Jerusalem on the map. And they were scattered through all the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. And, but Saul was ravaging the church, entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. So here we see that the killing of Stephen is, an, is a catalyst for people like Saul to try to eradicate the church in Jerusalem and, and surrounding regions. And Saul is, um, Luke says that Saul is ravaging the church like a crazed and possessed man. He's, he's going into house to house. He's pulling out people. He's throwing into jail. And as we read, the church is uh, fleeing, uh, is, uh, fle flees this persecution. And they scatter about the regions of Judea and Samaria. As you can see in the map, there's an upward movement now let's read another portion similar to this in Acts. And again, take a look at that map. Acts chapter 11, 19 to 22. I'm skipping because it refers to the same event. Acts chapter 11, 19 to 22. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. I'm pausing there so you can identify those places. Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Speaking the word to no one except the Jews. But there were some men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenist also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. So if we look at the map, Antioch is in modern-day Turkey, um, and, um, and, and then Cyprus is a, an island in the, in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, and Cyrene is uh, in modern-day Libya, or to your left. Again, here that we see that the, the persecution that arose over Stephen is a, is a, is a catalyst for the church to scatter both to the, to the west and to the north. And it went as far as Cyprus and Antioch, almost two extremes if you look at that map. 
And most of the most only shared the gospel to the Jews, but some of them coming from Cyrene to Antioch on the way of Cyprus, if you looked at arrow number two there, they pre- started preaching the gospel to the Greeks. And that started a movement in Antioch by these unknown, non, uh, unknown men. There's no name mentioned, but two people, Hellenistic Jews that received the gospel, shared the gospel with non-Jews. That was just a, um, a major event, a major event in the evangelization to the Gentiles. And we'll cover about the, talk about this more in, in coming weeks. But back to the point of persecution, and uh, you can turn, um, take down the map. So why did God permit for this phase of persecution to come upon the church? The ways of God are beyond our understanding. And it sometimes does not make sense. But we, from the advantage of looking back, we can see the glimpses of God, God's purpose in this. And while there are a million of reasons, I'm sure, in, in, God, in the mind of God, why he allowed persecution to the early church, there are particular reasons that I, I will bring up as to why persecution came upon the early church. Number one, and, and it's on the slide, the season of togetherness was coming to a close. The church was enjoying the blessings of being together, and, and you know, it started to create this aquarium effect, like all the fishes, maintaining all the fishes in the pond or in the tank, so to speak. And so, not saying that it is a wrong thing, but the church started to become more inward focused. We saw the, we covered the earlier challenges, right, with uh, Ananias and Sapphira, the discipline that came upon them. We covered the challenges uh, uh, that they had in, in not tending to the widows, the complaint that came, that came from the Hellenistic Jews because the widows weren't being tended to. And all these challenges are expected in the, in the context of a local church. But it's not the only responsibility of a local church. And it took a wave of persecution to transition the early church from that state of togetherness to, to, be, uh, to a season of being scattered, to, uh, scattered abroad to proclaim the gospel. Second, we see the fulfillment of Scripture in this. The, the early church took this as the fulfillment of Scripture, and we see this by their prayer of boldness in Acts chapter 4. When they prayed for boldness, they mentioned about the, the persecution that came upon Christ, and they included themselves in that as well. They're the body of Christ. They're the church of Jesus Christ, and they also knew that persecution was coming their way. So they did not pray against the persecution. They didn't pray for persecution to stop, but they prayed for boldness to endure the persecution. And as we know, when they prayed as a confirmation of the prayer, the prayer that place that they pray, were praying together in shook, and all of them were filled in the Holy Spirit. So they received a special boldness by the Holy Spirit to handle this moment that was to come. And lastly, we're seeing a democratization. In other words, a equal distribution of ministry responsibilities. The scattering of the church allowed believers to do ministry on their own. They became evangelists. They were not under the control of, of the apostles alone at that point. The Holy Spirit was guiding them in this journey, in scattering this, the, the seed of the gospel to the to outermost parts of the earth. We talked about the ministry of Philip and Stephen in past weeks. We, and, and chapter 11, uh, as I mentioned, there were two un- there's some unnamed men from Cyre- Cyrene and Cyprus who preached the gospel to the Greeks. We don't know who they are, but they were saved believers, filled in the Holy Spirit, sharing the gospel. So what can we learn from this? That ministry is not dedicated to a a few elite people. That the ministry is placed upon every single one of us. Certain people are placed in our life to equip us for ministry. There are authority, there are account people that we are accountable to, like pastors and uh, teachers and, and, and such but the, minute, the responsibility of ministry is uh, it's on each and every single one of us. In both of the, uh, both of the portions that we, we, we read, there's a phrase scattered being used in, in, in the, uh, the portion in Acts chapter 8 and in 11. In Greek, in Greek this term used is, in the next slide, the Greek, uh, this term is uh, dias, uh, diaspeiro, okay? 
Now, and that's a combination of two words. One, uh, the dia is a scattered across and, and, and then uh, spiro is a spread about. Um, in English, the word diaspora is, is, is derived from this Greek phrase. And maybe you have heard of this term, dia, diaspora. And this word, and this Greek word is used in the Greek Old Testament, the, the Septuagint. And I, w- I want to quickly read through some of the f- passages where this is used. And uh, this may show up on the screen or not. Uh, I'm not sure. But the first instance and, and, and the major instance that we see this is in the Tower of Babel. Genesis 11, verses 1 and verses 4, I will read. The, now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. Verse 4, they said, Come, let us build a, for ourselves a city, a tower whose top will reach into heaven, and let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. That word in Greek is used for scattered abroad. Genesis 11, 8 and 9. So the Lord, and then we know the story, right? So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore... Its name was called Babel, because there the, there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. In Leviticus, when God gives a list of blessings and, 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 and the list of punishment for disobedience, he says in Leviticus, Leviticus 26, 33, You, however, I will scatter among the nations, and I will draw out a sword for you as your land becomes desolate and your cities become waste. Ezekiel prophesies regarding the Babylonian exile in Ezekiel 12, 15. I'm just reading through this because of the lack of time. So they will know that I am the Lord when I scatter them among the nations and spread them among the countries. And lastly, in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, we see the hopeful prophecies. But I'll read from Ezekiel 11:17. Therefore, say, thus saith the Lord, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries among you have been scattered. And I will give you the land of Israel. And this, is, this prophecy is still being fulfilled as we speak. So as we fill, flip through the pages of scripture, we see a God who scatters people for his glory. He moves people, people groups, nations to fulfill his purpose. That was true since the beginning of time and that is true even today. In the Jewish diaspora, as we read through the prophecies, it was one of the largest ancient diasporas in the world. Is a scriptural and a historical fact. They were literally scattered across all the whole world. And I came to hear that there was even a, a community of Jewish people, even in, in Kerala as well. And they, they, I don't know how many of them are there, there today, but many of them actually traveled back to, uh, moved back to Israel. And when we read through scripture, we understand the purpose behind that scattering, or uh, that, that the creation of the Jewish diaspora. Now, when we turn to Acts, we're seeing the beginnings of a Christian diaspora. It took a painful persecution for God's people to be scattered. But unlike in the case of the Old Testament, the church had undergo the pain of persecution for their disobedience. This was the church taking up the cross and following Christ. They're willing to pay the price. Many of them could have hidden in Jerusalem and acted like they weren't Christians. But no, because of their, their conviction, they scattered abroad and they... And as we'll read, they took the gospel with them. They did not hide and, 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 and merge amongst the people acting like they were non-Christians. They actually represented Christ wherever they went. This leads me to talk about another diaspora. Uh, and because my time is short, I'm going to be really quick with this. You and I are familiar with this diaspora. And that's because we are part of this diaspora. And, and, and I want to talk a little bit about the Indian diaspora. And when, when we look at the map, uh, that's on the screen there for you, and uh, it just shows you a history of people from South Asia um, moving to other parts of the earth. It started with indentured labor, uh, being contracted out to essentially earn your way. Um, you're, 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 given, you're given a promise of, uh, if you come here and work for me, you will earn your way to uh, become a have your own land or, or earn your way to citizenship. And so many Indians in earlier centuries traveled all over the earth. And then over time, um, you know, because of the British colony colonization and such, many people were able to go to the Commonwealth countries. 
And then from, you know, from the independence of India onwards, you, you see a lot of migration to the Middle East and, and through other countries, especially to the U.S. and Canada and, and so on. This doesn't show really all the minor migration paths, but it shows all the major ones. Um, I mean, the joke is that you can find an Indian in any place in the world, right? Anywhere you go, there's a, there, ha there will be an Indian there. Um, and so th this is, we're part of the Indian diaspora. It's the largest diaspora in the world, about 17 and a half million people. And I'm not saying, I'm not giving uh, you know, everyone a geography lesson here. That's not my purpose. My purpose is to show that what, to, uh, for us to think about what is the purpose of God in all of this? Why, why are we part of this diaspora? In the next slide, uh, I, I just want to give you a, a breakdown of just Indian Americans, right? Four million Indian Americans in the U.S. This is the breakdown of religious aff affiliation. If you, I'm not going to break down in percentages, but just you can just think for yourself of what is the sliver of that pie for that that consists of Christians, uh, genuine Christians, and we're talking about four million Indian Americans. How many people you think? are following the true gospel. And if we go to the next uh, slide, I just want to give you a breakdown per cities, just to give you an idea of how many Indian Americans are populated through, through, the, through this nation, right? And, and uh, Oklahoma is not anywhere on that list, but uh, many other cities are. I'm just giving you an idea of the harvest. I'm giving you an idea of if we, are, if we are born into it, a family, an Indian family, that gives us tremendous opportunity and a tremendous open door into many people's homes and many people's lives that other non-Indians don't have. And one particular example that comes to my mind is as a, uh, a, one person and I were uh, distributing tracts in our apartment community. We knocked on a door thinking that it was just someone else, but it was actually uh, an older Indian uncle and auntie from a different uh, state of India. But my, the person that was with me, I happened to know Hindi, so we struck, struck a conversation, and they invited us into their home. Um, and I can, can't imagine a non-Indian having that opportunity of just being able to go into a random person's home, but just because of our background and, and, and the fact that we, uh, one of us knew how to speak Hindi, we were able to strike a conversation. I'm sure many of the church people who have know who this family is. Um, but... Um, we are able to sit there and talk to them and pray with them and, and, and head, head back. So I, I'm, I'm trying to uh, cast a vision for some of you who might be wondering, what is God's purpose for me in this nation um, at, at this time? And I'm, I'm telling you that God has scattered us here in this nation for a purpose. What is, what is the Lord? Our prayer ought to be not, not just about, okay, there's a great job that's opened up in another state or another city or um, my family needs me to go to a particular place or a particular city, it, is, it should be, God, what are the opportunities of the gospel that you have called me to, uh, to partake in? Um, so just look at the number of people. I mean, they've developed a burden for these souls. These are souls that need to be one for the kingdom of God. And you and I, because of, it doesn't matter if you're second or third generation Indian, we have, we have something that other people don't have. And Paul has said, Paul has said this that you know I'll become all things to all people so I can win, uh, win souls for the kingdom. You know so we know how to be Indian, even if we are second generation, third generation. We understand the challenges that are going through uh, our fellow Indian brothers and sisters. And and I'm, I'm giving this, I'm, I'm I'm casting this vision to those who are like me that have been born and brought up here for most of their life, to. To think about uh, what is God calling you to do, and I, I'm encouraged by many people, many young people that had no idea about India and went to schools that are 100% non-Indian, and then they go to college and they they get involved in South Asian Christian ministries, and 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 they, they see international students, and they have they suddenly have a burden for Indians, and I, I've been really encouraged to see that that. There are many young people that are having this burden to reach out to South Indians. And I, I just, uh, and, and as I conclude and as I uh, invite the worship team to come forward, I, I want to just read again, and, and in the last slide, uh, what are we to do in all these things? 
in Acts chapter 8, 4, we just read this, that those who were scattered went about preaching the word. That's our primary purpose. If you're called, and I, I hope you stay in Oklahoma, but you know what? If God calls you for some other opportunity, if you're scattered by God in a, in a, in a, for a good purpose, preach the word wherever you are. In Acts chapter 11, 19 to 21, it says, Those who were scattered traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching, speaking the word, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was up with them. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. That's what we ought to pray about is, Lord, wherever you are taking me, whether I'm even here in, in Oklahoma City, if you want me to stay, Lord, may your hand be upon me. Without the hand of the Lord, nothing that we do for the Lord can, can come to fruition. We can claim a lot of, lot of different things for the Lord, but we need the hand of the Lord upon us, church. And look at the result. The great number who believe turn to the Lord. Hallelujah. Let us take a moment of time and just let's ask for the Lord for that burden. If the Lord is giving you a, a certain openness to consider, consider the, the, the soul, the Indian American souls at least. Let's ask the Lord for his hand upon us. So we can do his ministry for the kingdom of God. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace. We thank you, God, for this time you've given us, O oh God, to, to dig into the word, to even see what you're doing through human history, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you have brought us up in Indian households. We thank you that you enabled us to have our generations grow up in India. We don't know why. But we know, God, that it is not an accident. That there's a purpose why we have the skin color we have, the, the purpose that we have, the, we know the languages that we know. There's a purpose why we have a certain kind of culture of value that we have been inundated with. And I pray that all those things that we have, that we will treasure them and use them for your glory, for the propagation of the gospel. I pray that you will call, Lord, a certain people, O oh Lord God, from our congregation, Lord, to be evangelist. Lord, they don't have to be full-time ministers. They just have to, Lord, just do ministry. Lord, they, I pray that you would give that burden and calling, O oh Lord God. It is the time is ripe, O oh Lord God. We pray for laborers, O oh God, to be called out, O oh God, for your kingdom, O oh Lord God. And I pray, God, that, that we see the harvest, O oh God, the four million souls, O oh Lord. We pray, O oh God, that you will use us just for, even if for a few souls, O oh Lord. I pray, O oh Father, that in this moment, O oh God, that there will be a such anointing that will come upon the people that are praying earnestly, O oh Lord God, that they would see the vision for the, 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 for the evangelization of the gospel, O oh Lord God. We give you all the praise going on, O oh Jesus. In holy, precious name we pray.